is great. <laughs> I'm looking all Sabbathy. <laughs> Good morning to you. Well, we'll say good morning to everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And welcome to Sabbath School. It's good to see all of you out there this morning. And we want to welcome those who are online as well. I can see you. No, I can't. But anyway, we're just glad that you've joined us here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, for Sabbath School. And before we begin, we'll have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, today we are so thankful to be called children of God. We're thankful to meet with uh, like believers in this place. And we pray for your presence as we uh, have our Sabbath school session and uh, uh, throughout the day, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Our opening song, we're going to sing it right now. And we want to encourage you to join along with us. The words will be on the screen, Christ for the world. <laughs> Christ for the world we sing. Our world to Christ we bring With loving zeal The poor and them that mourn The faint and overborn Sin sick and the sorrow one Whom Christ doth heal Christ for the world we sing our world to Christ we bring with a fervent prayer. The wayward and the lost by restless passion tossed, reading at countless costs from dark despair. Christ for the world we sing. Our world to Christ we bring with a joyful song. The newborn souls whose days reclaimed from marrow's ways, inspired with hope and praise to Christ belong. Uh, personnel in the West Central African Division. The West Central Africa Division sends missionaries to the front lines of mission in both the cities and remote, hard to reach areas. But mission also happens in Pierre's office at the division headquarters. Pierre is the administrative assistant to the president of the West Central Africa Division. Part of his job is to work behind the scenes making sure missionaries are placed where they are needed most. And while his efforts usually go unnoticed, Pierre doesn't mind and finds joy in being part of God's work. To me, I think uh, all those who work in uh, the vineyard or the Lord work in various capacities. Some do some work that uh, people can see, but others also work behind uh, the curtains, even if you're not on the front line for people to see. I think that is not the most important, but even in your very small corner, you can contribute to the progress of the Lord. Pierre wakes up early at 4.30 so he can beat the morning rush and get to his office. He answers emails, sorts out itineraries, and applies for visas for missionaries, among other things. I don't see it as a, an ordinary office work. I work in the church of the Lord. Working in the church is a blessing because we are called to work, to be co-workers with the Lord in the salvation of people. And as Pierre goes about his work, he comes in contact with people who need counsel. As a church elder, Pierre prays for the different people who come to his office. Sometimes he gives a word of encouragement to the missionaries who come before they head out to the mission field. 
nothing could have been really possible without the people who are working behind the scene. And some of us as leaders, we are just here to represent them. And uh, we are the public person, but those who are working beyond the scene in our division are serious workers for the cause of the Lord in our territory. So we are grateful for their life. We are grateful for their talent. We are also grateful for whatever they are doing. And we work as a team. Please pray for Pierre and the team in the West Central Africa Division. Pray that the Adventist Church continues to grow there and that many are reached for the kingdom. Thank you for supporting Mission. up the volume a little bit there we go that seems better now so uh, just a reminder this pick this slide uh, is to remind you that uh, the offering uh, for our, our mission offerings including the 13th Sabbath offering next week will go in this collection box there are two of them in the back of the room by the two rear doors and uh, just put it in a tithe envelope and mark it for Sabbath school missions and um, uh, also, uh, to those of you at home who are uh, sending in your tithe by uh, um, mail or bringing it and putting it in the box outside or whatever, uh, if you need tithe envelopes, be sure and put a note in your tithe envelope and uh, we will be sure that you get some more tithe envelopes uh, at home. So uh, just another uh, service of the coronavirus. Uh, to those who are, who are stuck at home. So, um, uh, next slide, Gary. It's time now for our lesson. Uh, I just wanted to remind you that not next week, but the week after, we'll start a new series of lessons on uh, the topic of education. Uh, Christian education, of course. This is, uh, uh, and how it fits into the whole pattern of the gospel. A very important topic, and uh, of course we have uh, a couple more lessons on making friends for God by uh, Mark Findlay, and uh, our uh, uh, just a reminder that if you need a quarterly, we still have some quarterlies from this quarter. We'll be passing out the ones for next quarter next week, um, and uh, but if you lose your quarterly or have problems with it, you can access it online at this website, sabbathschoolnet.ssnet.org is the address, or you can type, just Google Sabbath School Net, and it'll bring it, you to it. And then you click on the little quarterly there, and there's a couple of different options for how you want your text to show up when you click on the text. That's really a handy part of this version of the Sabbath School quarterly, uh, is that uh, all you have to do is just point and click and the text come right up in any translation you want to look at. Uh, and you can choose the translation right then and there. So a uh, very uh, good help in studying your lesson. And uh, the uh, lesson today is on a message worth sharing, which is about the three angels' message. And Abby is going to be leading out and we have... Uh, David and Judy Miller and Jason Vargas to uh, discuss this. So we'll let them have their own prayer and get started. Thank you so much. You guys join me in prayer real quick. Lord in heaven, I thank you so much that we have the opportunity to study your word together, that we have this time this morning on the Sabbath day that you have made to honor you and glorify you by recognizing what you have done. Please be with us now. Let your Holy Spirit dwell among us in this church and help our fellowship and our conversation on your word to be constructive and full of, um, of your goodness. I pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 I wanted to just talk about the, a brief introduction to our lesson. It's a good lesson this week, right, guys? Amen. Yes, it was a really awesome uh, lesson. So it's a message worth sharing, and we, throughout the week, we go into um, Revelation and um, the three angels' messages, and we talk about um, 
what our responsibility is as Christians today. And I like how Sunday, it starts off talking about, you know, the present truth. So with that introduction, I know we have a really cool video that kind of summarizes what um, our lesson was about this week. So I think we'll kind of jump into that and, and then we'll go through each day. Can we play the video? I'm sorry, maybe I didn't say that loud enough. Christ's sacrifice for us is universal. He paid for the sins of all people who have ever lived, regardless of when or where. So the gospel speaks to people of every language, culture and background. It bridges ethnic divides. It's the great news that God has triumphed over evil. Jesus, God himself, died the death we deserve so we can live with him forever. He came once to rescue us, and he will return to take us home. The Bible's last book, Revelation, was written especially to prepare the world for Jesus' return. It's an urgent message for our generation. Throughout history, God has regularly sent special messages to prepare the people for what was coming. In the first century, the message was about the Father's love revealed through Christ. Although the result of sin is death, Jesus has secured eternal life for all of us. This message of salvation will never be out of date. We can choose to receive it by faith. Revelation presents Jesus in an end time context to prepare people for his soon return. It exposes the falsehood of self-centered religiosity and man-made traditions. The climax of each prophecy is Christ's coming, when the conflict between good and evil will be ended. The earth will be made new. God will deliver us forever from the nightmare of sin. Revelation 14 unfolds God's crucial last day message to all people. It's an appeal to a 21st century generation longing for purpose in their lives. It cleanses us from guilt and gives us power to be overcomers. The basis for all self-worth is the fact that Christ created us and redeemed us. It points out that one day all injustice will come to an end in God's final judgment. It's incredibly good news because it reveals that injustice will not last forever. It's also an appeal to love and obey God in every aspect of our lives. To place Him first in all of our thoughts. To give adoration to God in all we do. To respect His commands and live godly lives. In an age of moral irresponsibility, when millions feel that they're accountable to no one but themselves, this message reminds us that we are responsible for our actions. It also points to the Sabbath as the very heart of worship. It exalts God as the Creator and invites all men and women everywhere to worship Him who have made heaven and earth and who gives us a sense of our true worth in Him. Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Talk it, pray it, sing it. Fill the world with the message of His truth. I thought that video was a really good summary. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's really nice. Anything, anything in there like stand out to you? Because, you know, it kind of summarizes our whole lesson and we'll get into more detail, but what parts of it kind of jump out to you is what speaks i i really like how the whole picture comes together and it, it's a, god is a god of order and in a time of relative truth there is a, his truth and it just really speaks to me on that yeah yeah i think we're in an age now where it's like he points out that uh, uh people whatever is is truth you know whatever somebody wants to believe is mm -hmm. you know, 
And to have an absolute like the scriptures that you can say, you know, like Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my word won't. And mm -hmm. of course, that the, the word that he uh, has especially made a, to reveal to the world, the enemy has kind of, there's even, I've heard some versions of the Bible that they were thinking about coming out with without revelation because mm -hmm. they, they thought it might be a little confusing for people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the truth of this is about Jesus and about his soon coming. And I uh, think... Uh, getting people ready you can see the urgency there right as, as our memory verse talks about the angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel and sometimes we forget that that's what our message is is mm -hmm. the gospel and i know i heard a sermon one time that compared talked about the great exchange god dying so we could live you know he took mm. our sins so that we could have his righteousness mm. it just you know it's almost incomprehensible well it is to humans it is you know yeah. Yeah. but that deep of a love yes that yeah. deep of a love but god did that because he lo he loved us yeah uh, I, on that point uh the uh the gospel I like the f word before that, the everlasting gospel. That means mm -hmm. it's not just for people of old or uh, it's relevant to me. It's relevant now. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. yeah. You know, there's so many people, I, I think, that have taken the whole word and think it's irrelevant in uh, this generation. You know, you know so much of uh, uh, the secular world around us, you know, has kind of grown to a point where... Uh, they, they see nothing that they think. Uh, and, of course, the Spirit uh, can impress it upon their hearts, but unless he's guiding them, you know, guiding them into truth, uh, so many people they don't know which way to turn. Right. But that's what our whole lesson is about, is, is knowing this present truth. And it's, you know, it's a message worth sharing, you know, to, to know it, to know this deep love, to understand um, the great exchange. I love that term. And to be able to share that. So we're gonna go into Sunday's lesson. And um, we talked about uh, Peter a little bit in this lesson and um, how he describes God's message to his generation. And did you guys look up that verse and what term did he use to describe God's, God's message? Yeah, it looks to me like uh, this whole notion of present truth, you know, mm -hmm. That uh, whole picture is one that uh, you could see the Bible is filled with examples, you know, just before the world was covered with water over the whole planet. God mm -hmm. didn't, you know, anytime some big event's coming, God does not leave people unwarned. He right. sends somebody to give a message and a big message and whatever it takes to get the word out so that everybody has a chance. Yeah, he's not trying to hide things from uh, us. Absolutely. He's trying to help us to understand and absolutely. to see the, the warning signs. And you're right, there was, I mean, we've seen this example in the Bible a lot. And I think we have a slide that kind of outlines um, some different present truths throughout the Bible. They made it into a quiz, it'll make it fun. So you talked about, about Noah, and in his time, the present truth that he was trying to get across to people was the flood, right? So that was, that was the present truth in his time. Do you guys, can you summarize what it was for Jeremiah? What was the present truth that he was trying to get across? Because you can keep, kind of see Jeremiah, yeah, that, uh, hey, we're getting ready to get creamed <laughs> right. by right. the Babylonians, and it's because we deserved it, uh, you know, yeah. uh, we've turned ourselves away, and, you know, like he said, one place there, uh, the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can mm -hmm. know it? It's like God has a reason to do this to try to catch right. our attention. But he didn't have to send Jeremiah, you know, but he, oh, but no. he did. He sent oh, that absolutely. messenger because he wants us to mm -hmm. be aware and he wants us to know. Same thing for John the Baptist. You know, he had a, a present truth in his time to share. wasn't a real popular message, though, and these guys weren't <laughs> no. treated like real, real heroes no. at the time. Well, even, even Joseph, it wasn't real popular for him to share to his brothers that there's coming, there's going to be, a, you know, he shared it to his brothers yeah, that his you guys are going to be, I'm going to be the ruler or, and you guys are going to bow down to me. But that was, that was God preparing even 
for Egypt to be saved from its seven years of famine. Right, right. Yeah, but you, you guys bring up a, g- a good point that the messenger isn't often well received. And we need to keep that in mind for ourselves as we go in and talk about revelation and the message that we have to share as Christians who are following Christ and what in this time of these last days, that that doesn't mean we're going to be liked. And it doesn't mean that it's going to be an easy road for us. Yeah, you can see Noah was ridiculed and Jeremiah, I understood he ended up in a pit, uh, you know, because they didn't like what he was saying. And John the Baptist got his head removed. So right. you can see again those kind of pictures uh, and, uh, you know, give us an idea, the whole notion that we also have present truth in our hands, mm-hmm. that this church has been assigned to deliver to the world is a task that's obviously far bigger than any anyone can imagine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So we, we have this present truth that, that Peter describes, and then... Um, it asks, what was this present truth message all about? You know, for, for Peter, he was talking about specifically the power and the glory and the return of Jesus Christ. That was, that was his present truth to share with, with people. And that's our present truth to share with people. You know, that's, that's where we're at in the, in the timeline of things, is to share this, Jesus is coming back, and we need to share, you know, his love. We need to share the gospel and the story of his life. And we need people to understand that he is going to come back and we have that hope. We're, we're kind of having to be a second John the Baptist, you know. Mm-hmm. Time is near. Repent. Turn, yeah. your way, turn your heart back towards God. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's an age, too, where people think the Bible's just cunningly devised fables. And I think mm-hmm. Peter's trying to say, no, 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 no. This business about Jesus, I was there, I saw him. And, you know, we were up there when, uh, you know, he was glorified like he's the king. And all that, uh, you know, and then at the end, of course, it makes it real clear that prophecy in old time was not by the will of man, but these holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Like God was orchestrating all this. He's the one who laid these messages at just the time mm-hmm. that needed to be put on the right person to deliver at the, in a timely way. I like how Peter used the uh, word negligent, too. He says, I will not be negligent to hold this information from you. And I feel like, you know, in a reverse way, that kind of speaks to our responsibility, that if we don't, and if we don't share the hope that we have, we can be held negligent. You know, we, that's part of our responsibility. Yeah, you could see how, how embarrassed and sad we might be to have the neighbors let her come up to us and say, you knew all this was mm. happening? Why didn't you let us know? Right, right. Amen. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to Monday, if that's okay. I have a, a big goal of trying to get through each day to, for this lesson because they're all so good. So Monday's focus is um, Revelation's end time focus and how it's, um, it's focused on the last events, and we have that, that picture. It gives us lots of um, text and Revelation to focus, and they all kind of conclude and paint the same picture. Did you guys get an idea of what this picture is. <laughs> you know, I remember one time visiting uh, our church's headquarters in Lincoln, Nebraska, where they have a, a ministry for the blind, mm-hmm. the hearing impaired, and they had this, Joe Maniscalco had done this beautiful mural on the wall, like 28 feet long, that had a picture of Christ coming like this. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, I remember they even had a blind man there with a seeing eye dog. And of course they were featuring that text there, behold, he's coming with clouds and every eye will see him, implying the ones who have not had good eyes. Uh, even they who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Like this is real, this is gonna happen. You know? right. and, the reality and, uh, of Christ reality, coming. Exactly. It'll be magnificent. You know, it'll, it's going to be this huge event. It's not gonna be something that happens in secrecy or is subtle and I love that that revelation really spells that out like he's going to come in in clouds and with a trumpet sounding and the angels um, will be with him it gives us really good to hang on to it too he doesn't just don't hear it once and you know read a read a go Mm -hmm. on to your next novel right (laughs) repeats that message over and over I also think uh, it's really important that we remember it's quickly, it's coming quickly. Yes. Especially in this day and age, we need to, we need to have urgency in, in delivering this message. 
definite sense of urgency. I like, I'm just going to read um, right at the beginning of, of Revelation in chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So it gives that sense of urgency, but I also feel like it edifies us as Christians to study and to understand the prophecy and to study and understand the message of the angels that is given because we have that responsibility and it says blessed is, are those who read it and understand it. So a Bible without revelation is an incomplete picture of who God is. It's an incomplete, incomplete uh, collection of, of the living word. So Revelation, I, I wanted to, before we move on to Tuesday, I really wanted to take a moment and look at Revelation twenty two seventeen because I think we have, especially as Adventists, we have a habit of looking at Revelation and some of the things that come to mind are the beasts and the, um, the image and the false worship and um, the, uh, the woman. So we have all these pictures of prophecy, but this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, right? So we need to keep our focus, and I say this for myself, we need to keep our focus on the story of Jesus Christ and what that, our responsibility is there. So uh, Revelation twenty two seventeen. 17. Um, would either of you like to read that? Does anybody want to read it? I'll read it. Okay. The spirit and the bride said, come. He who hears, let him say, come. He was thirsty, let him come. He who desires, let him take the water of life freely. So we have this invitation, right? And doesn't that speak volumes as to who Christ is? It, it reminds me of the story of Jesus and, at the woman in the well. He took the time and, to say, come to me and drink my water, living water. Mm -hmm. So we're given these warnings, right? We are given this, this present truth and this picture, um, just like, um, the people of old in the Bible, but we have this special invitation that speaks to us in a very present and current way. And Jesus says, come, and gives us that invite. Yes, this quote from Mark Finley is really good. Um, you guys can read it with me on the screen, but our Lord invites all of those who seek for eternal life to come to him. He then invites those of us who have accepted the message of salvation and are eagerly anticipating his return to join him in inviting others to accept the message of his love. That inviting others like that's the whole part of being a Christian right mm -hmm. like we have this hope and we discover it for ourselves and it's just this beautiful transformation of our heart that happens every day you know that we have to do every day but we have the awesome responsibility and the awesome privilege to be co-workers with Christ and I really loved how this lesson highlighted that So I'm going to go on to Tuesday. You guys will follow along with me. I'm talking uh, more about Revelation's end time message. And we get to go into a little bit more detail here. So Revelation um, 14 is kind of where our focus is for, for this day. And we talk about um, the different symbolism and um, like metaphors and wording that's used to describe Jesus coming and what we can expect. You know, people that have a garden, there's a certain time to plant, as Solomon says, and there's a time to, to reap and so forth. And uh, you could see uh, Revelation, the last part of 14, basically highlights uh, the time to, to harvest is here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, it, foretell, it portrays in kind of a symbol there of, of Jesus sitting on the cloud with a sickle in his hand, you know, and of course some of these artists have been real good at painting that sickle, you know, like a person working in the field, uh, chopping their uh, their golden grain, it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. Yesterday it kind of reminded me of that, going out into the garden and realizing, you know, uh, it's good to pick these things when they're just uh, at their peak, like the little cherry tomatoes, rather than letting them kind of get over the hill or let somebody else uh, get them first, you know. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I guess the same is true with God's harvest. There's a time, you know, and uh, uh, harvest, you, you just don't wait for three months and say, yeah, when I get to that in a few months, we'll come out and harvest this stuff. Right. I think that helps us to trust God's timing, too, and knowing that 
You know, sometimes I think we can be kind of impatient, like, oh, Lord Jesus, come now, come today. I would love that. But he knows the right timing. He knows when his harvest is ready. And we, and we have the, the harvest of the grain and the harvest of the grapes to compare and contrast here in Revelation 14. And you talked about the angels with the sickles and the, and the grain. But on, on the other end, we have the grapes. So, it's, you know, we have a two-part harvest here. The golden grain, or as I think Mark may have used the term, gory grapes, meaning mm. these were overripe. And these uh, almost seemed like Jesus was the one with the one for getting the golden grain. And, and then the, the other angel was the one, the destroying angel, to deal with the, uh, the, the ones who haven't accepted the message. Mm-hmm. But they've made their decision which way they're going. And so right. it's clear, clearly delineated by that time. And that's why we have such a responsibility now to give people that, that hope and exactly. that message so people can make that choice. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's a choice. You know, everyone has to make that choice. God doesn't Absolutely. want forced love or, or robots, as, as a lot of people say, but he and wants I'm, people to make that choice. Unfortunately, some people are, are caught up in a false notion that mm -hmm. God ahead of time makes the decision who everybody's going to be saved and there's nothing you could say or do to anybody that would change that and so if it's already cut and dried no need to worry you know mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Bible doesn't portray it that way you know Not like you say the idea of a choice is uh, clear and that, f that free will is pretty precious to us from the Garden of Eden till now it's a key part of our human nature The second part of, of, our, of our lesson on Tuesday, it talked about the first angel's message. And that's kind of the whole heart of this week's um, lesson is, the is what the first angel talks about. Um, maybe we could just go ahead and read verses um, six and seven. If you all want to read it, read it with me. You can read it from the screen. And then I saw another the angel, angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. I think the detail of this angel's message is really beautiful. And it's the longest, you know, as far as words go, of, of the three. That notion, sometimes people uh, may take the King James rendition there with the word fear, and, uh, and yet uh, the Greek makes it clear there's other wider meaning that, you know, a solemn reverence for, mm -hmm. for God, you know, one one who has great respect for. Right, but, I came across this verse several weeks ago about the fear of the Lord, because many times we do get a misconception, but it's always good to let the Bible interpret itself. Mm -hmm. And Proverbs 8.13 says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, mm -hmm. pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. So, you know, I think we can hate the things that God hates, yeah. you know. And um, he says the froward mouth is one thing that he, he does not like very much. <laughs> and I looked up the definition of froward, and um, basically it means from the dictionary, habitually disposed to disobedience and opposition. Mm. And as you think of it, it's kind of like a mindset, you know, which leads to action. What's what we think that leads to our actions. And Philippians 2 talks about, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. So it's to fear God to me is having the mind of Christ mm -hmm. and um, Having, having a mind change, you know, an attitude change, an attitude adjustment, 
and I uh, think that's probably what most all of us need, right. is to have Christ in our hearts and our minds. And how can, we, how can we share the hope that we have if we don't have that, if we don't have a Christ-like mind? Exactly. Mm-hmm. I think so many people that haven't thought along these lines, it's so foreign to them that it, it could be... Uh, intimidating and of course a person no matter who they are what their background is they always respond to kindness mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, or at least uh, or might shock some people in this day and age <laughs> that verse also says you know and worship him that made heaven earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters um, and if we look towards the Sabbath what is the Sabbath what is the Sabbath? It's the celebration of his creation of earth. Mm-hmm. And so he's always bringing us back to the fact that he is our creator. He is there to restore us. He's God of order, God of rules and law. I feel like, you know, we get this throughout the whole Bible, but I feel like God is always trying to bring us back to keeping it simple and understanding I love you. I created you because I wanted to love you. And I want you to remember I am your creator because it takes you back to the roots of why you exist. Mm -hmm. And you're right, because of that, because we are looking at God as the creator, the Sabbath is, is is the gift of that, is the product of that. And this angel is telling us to focus on giving God the glory, to fear him by, ha- by having a Christ-like heart and a Christ-like mind, by recognizing him as the creator. It gives us that, that reason to worship him. There's a really good, I don't know if we have it on the slides, but there's a really, I'm sure we do, we have a really good quote from Ellen White in, at the end of Tuesday's lesson. Yeah, this one here. Um, I just want to go ahead and read this because I, I think it really is worth it. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in a world as watchmen and light bearers. And we talked about light a couple of lessons ago. We talked about being the light and being the salt of the earth. To them has been entrusted the uh, last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import. The proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. If that doesn't give us a call to responsibility, I'm not really sure what would. It, it's definitely hyper-focused. Mm-hmm. Um, we should only take up this. This should be our mantle. Um, there's lots of different movements in the world right now. Mm -hmm. And it would be easy to get carried away in one movement or another movement, but we need to remember we need to be hyper-focused. A cancer research facility isn't going to go take up diabetes or something like that. Their their job is to focus on cancer research. Our job is to focus on repent, turn back to God. He's coming again, and he's coming soon. Mm -hmm. That's good. That I, I tend to be the kind of person to get distracted. Sometimes you go in a room and say, oh, this project needs to be done, and you get caught into that and, you know, find yourself running to another, oh, oh yeah, I could work on this. And, oh, yeah, I forgot to finish this one, you know. And so it's, it's easy sometimes to, like you say, to allow other things to press in, and especially in an age where uh, you, we get so, your, your mind gets bombarded with so many uh, messages mm-hmm. as the days go by. And uh, I think, uh, like you said, to stay focused, what is the message for the time? And it's such a gift that we have, that we have this as our focus and our purpose because, you know, we live in a time that I didn't live 50 years ago, I didn't live 100 years ago, but I believe we live in a time that I think more so than ever people feel so um, in need of a purpose and in need of being able to identify themselves with something and people are looking for that because the world is so chaotic 
And there's so much going around, going on, and we can see, you know, with different social movements that people are really looking for something to grasp onto and say, this is my identity. This is what I'm going to stand for. And God gives us that. He gives us that purpose and says, you know, you are my child, and I have a great purpose for you. You know, your time on earth is not just, you know, to walk around and wait for me to come back. But you have a purpose here, and, and I have a plan for you here. And that shows his, his great love as our father. And that, that gives me a, a great sense of purpose and the value that he's put on my life. It, ma- it makes me think, do my neighbors know um, that the time is coming near? Right. Have, have I shared right. that with them? Have I taken that time? Do they know that I, say it, uh, that I believe that I believe that God is coming soon? Have we shared that Advent message with my neighbor? Yeah. I mean, have I taken that time? It's something that I should be focused on. Yeah, who do I see every day that doesn't even know what I believe, mm. that doesn't, doesn't know the hope that I have, that I should, should and could be sharing that with them? Sometimes there has to be a certain level of getting acquainted with people before they'd be willing to ask, too, you know. Mm-hmm. And that part of that mingle with men is one who desires their good kind of fits into that whole, whole idea. Uh, that reminds me, uh, when I was in Laos uh, for, for, as a missionary for a year, um, we, we were instructed to make sure um, we lived our life in such a way that people asked questions. And it mm-hmm. happened all the time. I mean, it, it, it was a pagan, Buddhistic religion over there, and they often would ask, uh, "Why are you, here, drink some beer. Why don't you drink? And like, no, 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 my body's the temple. And you wouldn't bring beer into the, oh, yeah, I wouldn't. And it just, sometimes it naturally lends itself easier, but we have to find ways now in, in here, we have to find ways where we can tie that back all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is true, you could see following closely, you know, I think one of our passages and one of the other days, you know, whatsoever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all the glory of God, you know. That whole notion of our health message being tied to this final message is clearly given as part of the package and uh, and you can see following all the counsel God gives makes you look like as my dad used to say you would stick out like a sore thumb in a world like that <laughs> you know that everybody would notice that there's some difference over here but unfortunately there's a tendency as uh, I think uh, Paul mentions in Romans 12 uh, to be c- uh, Paul he ad- admonishes do not be conformed to the world or the things you know, in the world you know, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold you know but there's mm-hmm. a great pressure to do that to all of us let's go ahead and go on to Wednesday's lesson with with these thoughts in mind and we look at first Corinthians and we look at Ecclesiastes and we kind of dig in a little bit more detail about that fear of God and that glory of God and what those actually look like. And this verse in Ecclesiastes, it's, it's really good. It says, you know, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. That, that's a really bold statement. This is the whole duty of man to fear God and to keep his commandments. I remember reading a passage one time where it gave you the idea, of course, the foundation of God's whole commandments is the law of love. Mm -hmm. And you kind of get the idea. I remember reading another passage where it says, and when we love others as Christ has loved them, for us, his work is complete. And you think, oh, (laughs) if that law of love gets written on our hearts to the point that we're just in doing what we want to do, we do what he wants us to and in loving others like he loved them, that's a sign, boy, he's really done a, done a number on you, you know, and that's yeah. the kind of uh, work we all need. I think it, you know, goes back to the, the balance of love and respect or love and honor. You know, I, I can say that I love my husband, like that's an easy, easy thing to say, but to say that I respect my husband and to say that I honor my husband, you know, they all, they all go hand in hand. You know, if you love someone, you respect them as a, as a person and you will honor them and, you know, their wishes and their boundaries and the things that they say. And 
I think about that with our relationship with God. If we love him, we will keep his commandments. If we love him, we will honor him, and we will have a regard and a respect and a fear for him. This 1 Corinthians, you know, I think we've, I've read this verse a lot, talking about how um, our bodies are a temple of God, right? And, you know, and you talked about, you know, Jesus gives us these great examples of how to minister to people and meeting their needs first. And so we have this, this great ministry built out about taking care of our bodies and how that can be used in ministry. But it goes farther down and says, um, let me get the right verse here. Yeah, I'll just read the one from the screen. I like the wording here better. So, or do you not know what your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you, um, whom you have from God, that you are not your own, that you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And that, that last part is what I kind of wanted to get at. We have the, the ministry of health and how taking care of our bodies honors God, but what we do with our bodies also honors God. You know, the places that we go, you know, the different actions that we do with our body, how we um, present ourselves, these are all things that honor God as well. So it's not, you know, it's the inside and outside kind of thing, the whole picture. And it specifically says, and your spirit. So, you know, it's not just a physical thing, but we're talking about it as spiritual, taking care of ourselves spiritually. When I read this, I, I, it helped me to understand how to equip myself to share that good news and to share that good message. What did you guys think of the, um, the quote at the end of the lesson in the little green box that that's always at the bottom of the page? It talks about think of how important the Sabbath is as a reminder of our, of our creator and hence the one who alone is worthy of our worship. We kind of talked about this in the beginning, but in regards to this last day message, how do you guys think, what does that look like when we are sharing the, me the message and we are sharing the hope? You can see that a worship comes at the very core of, um, of these messages and the very end time conflict that's going to come is, um, is worship, uh, over worship. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and that was one of the things that started the first war in heaven was when Lucifer kind of got to looking over and thinking everybody's, you know, bound down to, uh, to Jesus. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, I'd kind of like to have a little bit of this respect. You know, I'm right on up there with the big three or four or whatever. You know, he was in the most respected created being that apparently had ever been made, uh, you know, high on their pecking order in terms of the general, in terms of the angel armies and so forth. But, and then to, to make his bold assumption that I'm going to make my throne above the stars of God, you can see this whole idea of trying to have the whole world at some point mm -hmm. come down and worship him is going to be on one side. And then God says, you know, um, there's a special day I've set aside for, for people like he pointed out, is the day that points to me as a creator. And, um, and if we have gotten in our whole way of thinking, how can we, if we can do away with the first few chapters of Genesis, we've done away with creation. You throw the Sabbath out at the same time and we push in evolution that we just happened and then any kind of moral responsibility all kind of disappears at the same time, you know, mm -hmm. and you can see how the enemy, you know, just like a, flood comes in to try to push us one way, whereas the Sabbath, God says, oh, you get se one seventh of your time spend with me. If you really love me, keep my commandments and uh, come to know me better. You, you can see that's why Satan was so um, intent on doing away with the Sabbath, substituting another day of mm -hmm. his choosing. And um, if we could forget the Sabbath, we could forget the Creator. And uh, of course, that's where Satan's darts are focused. That's the one he hates. And if he can't get at God directly, he will get at God's children. 
by destroying the Sabbath, at least trying to destroy it. So, I think uh, truth is an interesting word because if you add anything to it, it makes it less true. Like right now, we're all uh, the world seems to be into relative truth, and you know, truth is truth. If you add relative. Uh, that, that changes it and has now made it less true. And, and that's what it's done. It's taken it, really, this is the core of Satan's, of Satan and who it is. He knew the truth and he wanted it to be his truth. Mm-hmm. And it changed it from, it changed it from God's truth to a relative truth, one where he got to dictate what's true. And that's appealing because we like to, we are selfish creatures by being, and we would like for what we believe to be true, but that's not necessarily the case. Right, that doesn't make it true. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's one of the fundamental tenets of spiritualism is whatever is, is right. And I think that notion when we fall into that kind of modern philosophy, you know, that my truth is as good as your truth is, mm. is whatever, you know. And, 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 and it also, it, it puts out the idea that uh, don't try changing my truth. Don't change me. I'm, I'm right and you're right. You know, don't, uh, don't, don't. And I think we've gone even one step further. We now want to say love is love and whatever. It's relative love. But no, there's very clear. God is love. In the Bible, it's very clear what is love. And it, it's under yeah. those Ten Commandments. Um, you know, it's very specific rules he's put for us, but love is not just whatever love you want it to be. There's a very specific set of rules that he's put out that show love. Right. Given, given that clear picture. No, I think that that's so good. You guys really highlighted that so well because, you know, the Sabbath, Sabbath as worship, it's not just a day. It's a commandment from God that was there at the very, very beginning And there is no reason for it not to be here today. God is not a God who changes. The God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. He's had this plan for us uh, the whole um, span of time of of humanity. So it's just to remember that, to remember that what he has commanded for worship is what he requires. And that's what he asks for us to show that we love him. And that doesn't change. So we're going to move on to Thursday. Kind of... Um, getting to the, I guess, the, the climax of our lesson, we talk about God's final appeal. And it talks about um, the second and third angel's messages. And if, if you guys feel comfortable with it, could you kind of give me a summary of, of what the second and the third angels are all about? You know, uh, Babylon was a country uh, that... Uh was responsible. God used them to come over when his people had misbehaved for so many centuries. The kings had all fallen away to have Nebuchadnezzar come and take them away captives. And they all moved out to Babylon uh, by force or whatever. And they, they had generations where they grew up in Babylon. And then at some point, God says, we're going to take after 70 years my people back to Jerusalem and come out of Babylon and come back to Jerusalem. And only a handful decided they wanted to leave. But God had his people over there in Babylon, and, and they needed to come out. And I think he's using this illustration, of course, in end times to realize I got so many people all over the globe in every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And it's time when the chips, I mean, when it's clearly delineated, you, you need, like, like Joshua said, choose ye this day whom you'll serve. Are you going to be on this side or on that side? Mm-hmm. And so I think part of that is that same kind of appeal to a world who are you going to serve? You know, come out of her, my people. It's fallen. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's had all kinds of false notions that will lead your mind astray, and it's not going to save you. It's just a false path. Mm-hmm. I, I really like what um, the Revelations 14, 8 says in the, um, what version is this? Uh, World English Bible. It says here, uh, and Another, a single angel followed, saying, Babylon the Great has fallen, which has made all the nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of her sexual immorality. Um, I I don't know if you've paid attention to the news, but recently there's been this big um, thing about cuties. You know, we've reached a point of sexual immorality that's going back to the days of Babylon, and and we need to call out from that. Mm -hmm. Right. You can see the the picture of the... uh Athe- atheism, you know, and just no God and no no rules and whatever. 
whatever feels good, you know, that's your, that's your new, new guide. I like how it split, how the angels, they split up these messages because what you read from um, verse eight is second angel, right? Second angel comes and announces the fact that Babylon has fallen. This, you know, this false system has fallen and um, it is wrapped up in, you know, this, this fornication and this, these evil ways. And then it goes, and then the third angel comes and says with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So it's saying that if you are, you know, involved, if you are in this, um, in this beast and, and, and you are worshiping, you know, this, uh, this system that says, that is wrapped up in this fornication, I was looking for the right words, that is wrapped up in this fornication, that you're part of that wrath. So to understand what it is, I think it's interesting that the first angel points out, this is what it is. Understand what it is. Understand that this is sin, that this disgraces God, that the wrath of God is coming on this. And then the third angel comes and says, this is the consequence. You know, understand what it is and understand the consequence. And that's how I talk to my children. You know, I appreciate when God talks to me like a child because I can understand it. You know, saying this is the sin, this is the consequence, and then that invitation to come out. Yeah, I really like how Angel 1 is concerned with this is where you should be. Mm -hmm. Angel 2, uh, this is what's bad, mm -hmm. and Angel 3, here's what's going to happen. Right. Just you know, like it seems like we're in an age now, too, the whole notion of being respectful for, um, for law, what we call anarchy, I guess, is where let's just throw over all law and become a law unto yourself. And God is, of course, the great lawgiver and the one who says, uh, we will respect my law and my mercy is great. And I've waited a long time. I've been very long suffering. But there finally comes a point where for true justice and judgment uh, as part of that picture, you know, the everlasting gospel and the idea of judgment was part of that. And the whole concept in our thinking, of course, many times puts our justice system uh, pretty, uh, you know, you get some kind of subpoena to appear. I got one of those one time to, you know, give a witness deposition in a court. And, you know, it's a day you need to be there. You know, mm -hmm. it's a timely situation. You don't just say, yeah. eh, whatever I feel like it. <laughs> Nothing uh, they to have ways to let you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, of course, God's the same way. But what's nice, someone pointed out, is that the presiding judge and the deciding judge and your attorney is also the same one who died to save you from your sins. You mm -hmm. know? And so it really gives you some real encouragement. I really like how the third angel ends on um, verse, verse 12. It says, Here is the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And that's ultimately what our, our goal has to be, is to be keep the commandments mm -hmm. and share the faith of Jesus. Yep. You know, to have, that's kind of where mercy and, and justice, or grace, uh, grace as well as, uh, as the law. The law and grace are two parts of our salvation picture. Yep, and it all boils down to worship, like you were saying. It's all about who we are worshiping in everything that we do. Well, thank you guys so very much for um, being on the panel with me today. I really appreciate um, having you guys up here with me to talk about this really awesome lesson. Our uh, next week's lesson um, for um, our adult Sabbath school will be all about a step in faith. And I believe this will be the last lesson for this, um, for this quarter. So it's our, our last lesson in making friends for God. It'll be a really awesome lesson to wrap that up. Would you close us in prayer, Dr. Miller? Yes. Gracious Father, we are so thankful that even in these end times, you have not left your people without uh, help, that you've given us this powerful book that reveals not only about our Jesus and about the Lamb, but that he is going to be the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and one that uh, 
at some point, every person, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But before the end of that millennium, at the beginning here, we want to be part of the group that decides now to keep your law and pray that, that you'll write that law on the fleshy tables of our hearts so that we'll be in doing what we want to do. We'd be doing just what you'd have us to do. Thank you for your Sabbath. Thank you for the blessings. And we just pray, Father, you'd put fire in our bones to be able to do as prophets of old have done to help proclaim with urgency this final gospel message that Jesus loves us, he's here to save us, and he um, has a very relevant message for 21st century that I am coming and I am coming soon. And we just pray you can help us do our part in our sphere of influence, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all.